Okay, hi folks. Uh, so it's the wrap-up session, basically. So all the questions that you have, you collected uh, towards the end. Uh, we will we'll take those. Uh, but first of all, I would like to uh, set the stage um, by simply asking uh, 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 Randy and uh, Brandon about uh, the business need, basically. When you start an API strategy in your organizations, what was the business need that drived your uh, technical journey, uh, if you may explain? Sure. Well, um, since BNY Mellon has been around for over 200 years, there's lots of legacy technology and roaming all over different hidden quarters of the company and not really good tracking of it centrally. So part of it was just to simply get see what's there and find out where the redundancy is and just try to put some discipline over all the services that are out there. Also, BNY Mellon is a company that's acquired a lot of other companies over time, so there's a lot of intentional redundancy, but some of it's not intentional, so part of it was that. Um, part of it was trying to just uh, help our customers get to data in a more modern ways. Some of them were still using things like FTP, where where a RESTful call would have served them much better, so they could get um, data on demand, not when we happened to drop it in, in the middle of the night through FTP. So just some of the, it's really just, um, it, was, it was really just to solve the problem of being able to sort of shine a light on everything so we could all look at everything holistically, make sure we have a unified experience for our customers by imposing a certain level of rest and by using all the adjacent standards like OAuth 2. Um, and um, I guess that's, that's really it. Just, just really letting people basically use modern day frameworks like Angular and things that assume where the native language is REST and they don't, they don't want to talk to whatever our arbitrary, um, well, not, they're not arbitrary, but whatever technology stacks we had accumulated over the years. So it was really just to try to rationalize everything we had. Yeah, I think for BYU it was, I mean, very much the same thing. We had a lot of legacy stuff that's hidden behind the curtains, you know, only the developers that developed it knew it existed or those few select that were allowed to touch it. Um, as well as, yeah, to modernize. I mean, we still today, as a higher ed org, we have a hard time sometimes getting on-campus customers to migrate. We still have a process today where we have a college that gets a data update once a week via email in an Excel file. And they load that up into their system. And so trying to moderate all of that and modernize it and make it easy for them to get at. Um, so if I may follow up on that, um, so I, I would assume uh, you you probably have have probably have to do some course correction along this along the way. Um, how would you measure the maturity of your API platform? What were the KPIs? Um, well, I'd say so. We've been doing this for almost two years. We really started. We built the store, but then there was nothing in it. It was an empty store, and so it took a while to build up some inertia. At first, it was hard to get people. Uh, to be interested in doing it because they already had their day jobs, but this kind of became a company mandate, which was good. Um, and so uh, after all this time, I'd say we're kind of done with our V1, or close to being done with our V1, and now we're trying to add even a little bit more structure. Uh, and we didn't, we knew we weren't, we didn't have the bar quite as high as it could be, but that wasn't, we didn't want to make it impossible for people to start out. So we tried to gently let people get used to the whole system, and now we're trying to raise the bar a little bit and do a V2 of everything. So I, I guess. But we do have customers that are using our APIs where you've monetized some of them. And we actually do use these APIs ourselves internally for building our own UIs, which we re in turn offer to, offer to customers. Those, those applications are written in, in terms of these APIs that we've subscribed to ourselves. So we do exactly what we ask our customers to do. So I guess, I, you know, I don't know if there'll be a third or a fourth version, but we have something that's viable now. But I guess you could say we're maybe halfway there because the V2 will be much better. I think in a similar way, I mean, we measure some of that in just the ease of how easy is it for our developers and for those consumers to utilize that platform? How many, you know, are we hearing the same complaints over and over again? Um, and then on top of that, some long-term support, long-term maintenance, how did that work out? Kind of with the old system we're retiring now, um, we thought we made some good decisions. And only as time went on did we figure out just how painful some of those poor decisions ended up being. Um, and kind of had to do a complete you know, 180 from what we were doing there. And so I think we can kind of measure that both in the meantime, you know, currently as we're going on, um, but then some of that maturity just comes from how well does this maintain over time. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, so the next question I actually want to start with Nuan. 
um, with, with his experience. Uh, I know that Noah and myself, we have done a lot of architecture sessions uh, with a lot of customers. I would like to uh, get Nuan's opinion on um, wh what have you seen the key success factors uh, when it comes to the successful use cases that have been realized? Uh, <clears throat> so in, in my opinion, what I've seen, uh, what I've observed is that the most of the success cases come from cases where customers follow an iterative approach rather than trying to figure out the entire 100% use case and try to implement the whole big thing all at once. So the ones that start small, maybe you know, get a few APIs up and running, learn from it, and then adapt as you go along, get a few more, do whatever the tweaks you want, study the system, learn how it goes. And the, basically, the ones that follow an iterative approach rather than thinking of the entire big picture. So I think that's one of the uh, key factors in, uh, uh, in getting your API story successful. All right. All right. Thank you. So following up on that, uh, another question for Andy. So uh, we saw a very complex demonstration and a complex uh, uh, build of uh, and customizations of WS2 API Manager. Um, uh, so. It was a lot of automation, a uh, lot of, uh, I think, a lot of improvements to develop a productivity. Um, what was your take on that? How did you start on that, and what was your thought behind that? Um, well, so the WSO2 API management platform is pretty complete, but there were a few areas that I kind of highlighted that weren't quite sufficient for what we needed to do. Some of it is strictly just regulations that we're under, and some of it was being able to facilitate things like group collaboration. But even that wasn't completely clear. We didn't have that at the beginning. That's a relatively new feature. So we started out, and then pretty soon it was we were in the situation where people were trying to edit each other's APIs, and we didn't really have a good solution for that. So we, we actually started out fairly minimal. And we, what you see now is, the, is we, the, the areas that we revved were the areas that we noticed were the greatest pain points. And the other thing, the other philosophical thing we were really trying to achieve was really give people the, a complete self-serve environment. We were, there's a lot of process at our bank, as there are at a lot of large companies, and that's fine. You need that at certain levels. But at the, we, we, we still wanted to give people kind of a playground so they could try. So a lot of the, what we did and a lot of the automation is around enabling people to come and just try things and experiment and get their feet wet and find out if, if they can come up with a, a solution that would work for them. So that's... That's, uh, that's kind of what led anyway. We started with the MVP concept and just sort of wherever we saw the pain points, we've just been progressively trying to automate or building support tools around those cases. All right. Um, uh, so fr uh, from Braden, uh, I would like to ask, uh, how was your adoption like? I know that you have done customizations on subscription workflows, et cetera. What was your experience on that? Um, actually, really good. We've been pleasantly surprised with how easy a lot of that stuff was to plug. Um, for example, taking that same, that, uh, plugging the subscription workflow, we had a group of developers come to us and they said, our API, we just can't let anyone subscribe to it. You know, we have certain, the same thing with the regulations, they had regulations around it, it included financial data. Um, they needed something more in place there. And so we kind of discussed it with them, and at first we were thinking that it was going to be really hard to implement and, you know, was not something we wanted to do. But when we actually got digging into the code and, and seeing how we could handle that with WSO2, we were pleasantly surprised at how easy it was. And once we figured that out, we said, yeah, we're happy to do that because there were a lot of other use cases where that fit really well. What are the improvements that you think uh, uh, that even we can add to the product? And uh, what are the things that you um, I think that there's, there's a couple of things that we've had issues with. Um, the search, for example, that's probably 90% of the reason we developed our developers portal was just around the complex types of search we wanted to do. Um, and WSO2's, the store search was fairly basic. We could search by certain parameters like name or this is in the description or things like that. Um, but we definitely couldn't dig in and search what was in the Swagger document, um, you know, and notes like that in there. Um, which was, which is a lot of the reason why we did what we did with the developer portal. Um, that, you know, some of the subscription stuff, and I know that you and I have talked about it, with the subscription we could have set up the Beeple server mm. um, and had all of that, not had to hook it on our own, but where we only have that one use case currently, we didn't want to go to all the effort to spin up some extra servers and to plug all that in just for something that we could do fairly simply with it's under a couple hundred lines of code all together, including sending the emails. And so we decided to plug that. And some of those things might be a little easier, you know, if we allowed 
for just those little tiny tweaks to happen without the necessity of a whole other server. Uh, Randy, what, what are your inputs? Well, um, I mean, there's the functionality is all there someplace or another, and there, there's so many different ways you can extend any one of the components that the hard part, you can do it. There's, a, there's practically no place that isn't pluggable. We also, by the way, are in the process of doing exactly what you just described. Uh, you just described, and we might use the business process server to do the manage the workflow behind what happens when someone sub subscribes, or we might use our own, own internal one. But the point is you have a solution, and I, I think the only thing that I, would, I wish was better would be, I wish there was more uh, community support uh, it'd be nice to, I'd, I'd like to be able to go to Stack Overflow and search for something and find the result that I could use. But, uh, you know, to make up for it, though, you guys have, have really, really excellent uh, professional services, and you guys are very responsive, and we've never really hit a, a dead end there. But it's, you know, it's open source. You, if it had more of an open source feel where you, could, you felt there were other people using it that were sharing their information, that would be helpful. But, it, but all the functionality is there someplace or another. You just have to find it. Um, so with that, I'd like to open the stage for Noan to uh, give a little bit of uh, feedback on the API Manager 3.0 and what to expect um, uh, from the improvements point of view. Yeah, so uh, definitely we are looking at uh, some of the like change in the product, uh, with, uh, especially with the integration of Ballerina, as you saw. So one of the main things that are going to happen in the product is that the gateway component is going to be replaced by a Ballerina runtime. So, like, you're going to get uh, all the Ballerina editing capabilities right there on the API publisher uh, portal, where you can define all your policies, transformations, and all of that. And another main improvement, like, is we are making the product quite container native. So even in the current mode, it can run in containers, but it still has uh, quite a significant memory and CPU footprint and about a 30 second, 40 second startup si time which isn't ideal when it comes to the container world. But we are looking at making it more container native in the sense that with uh, very low memory footprints, uh, uh, two, three second boot up time likewise. And uh, one other significant improvement is like, if you look at the gateways, currently uh, the, the artifacts that you deploy on the gateways are done in a push manner. So your publisher needs to know where your gateways are and it, it needs to have the capabilities to push. So we are moving from a push model to a pull model, where you could bring up your gateways dynamically, and whatever comes up and asks for an API, it is as if it has the proper configurations and credentials will be given to you. So a, a, a more of a dynamic nature in the gateways, rather than being a pre-configured or pre-known set of gateways. Um, yeah, so, so, so these are some of the main improvements that we are looking at. And also, another one I forgot to mention is right now we have one single binary um, which hosts different profiles. So instead of having one runtime and having different profiles inside it, uh, we are thinking of making it into different runtimes so that the complexity of the product reduces significantly. Where you don't have to consider configuring different interactions between different components. Uh, and you know, separating out the deployments. We are, we are trying to make it uh, a more of a natural thing, where when you, when you start the survey itself, uh, all of these different profiles boot up in different different runtimes, so that uh, you have minimal configurations. So yeah, this is, these are some of the highlights that we are looking at um, on API Manager 3.0. All right, thank you. So so with that, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, you know architectural uh, practices that comes, uh, you know, like the modern architectural practices. So in my, my talk that I talked about, uh, there was a notion of no ESB kind of a concept. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on microservices, container, weighted architectures? Uh, what is the role of an ESB or services gateway? What are your opinion? Well, like a lot of companies, we're also moving in that direction. Our, our uh, future platform that's in, in development and almost in production is kind of em embraces the whole container concept. and and Docker and everything else. So that's the direction we're moving in as well. I mean, we like the, from a design point of view, we already try to follow the principles of microservices of enabling small teams to get their job done without depending on too much uh, part of their stack that someone else is delivering, e even at the expense of redundancy. But I think that um, 
You'll always need, if you're ever going to try to integrate with the old, you always need to build bridges. You're always going to need the equivalent of an ESB one way or another. I don't think there's any way around that. And even if you've modernized everything today, that need will come up in five years again because things are going to change again. So that basic functionality of being able to do transformations of message types and payload types and protocol types and transports and everything else, I think that will always be there. Uh, I think the idea of not having one centralized gateway or putting too many eggs in one gateway basket is a good idea. So I think the idea of breaking it up into smaller lightweight containers is a great idea. But I, th I think we would always keep the gateway and the ESB as separate hops because the usage in the ESB is, in some cases, much higher. They scale differently. But being able to have multiple, multiple gateways uh, that are cheap to, to spin up and everything and multiple, multiples, multiple ESBs, that'll be great. And that's completely in, in line with what we're planning on doing as well. So we actually kind of have a little bit of a different approach to that. Um, at BYU, one of the things we like to say is uh, dumb pipes, smart ports. And so we don't really love to shove a ton of smarts into our ESB, for example. Um, our reasoning behind that is that it likes to obfuscate what's actually going on from the developers. And so then when we do migrate, we do try to make changes or we you know, move to a new product, something like that. Um, a lot of times things aren't thought of because they weren't handled in the product, they were handled in a pipe somewhere. And so we've actually kind of tried to steer away from that as much as possible. And where we actually end up using the ESB a lot is in the API manager specifically. Um, we don't use it outside of that, but we do use it for some of the things like our legacy transformations for authentication. Um, we use it minimally for XML to JSON, um, but we try to kind of shy away from that. We'll get developers I'll get developers probably once a week that come to me and say, well, I want you to do this in a mediation sequence. And we kind of have to push back because our philosophy right now is that if it can be done in the product, that's where we want it done. Because then it keeps all of that knowledge with the domain team and it's never outside of their domain. They know everything that happens. And so that's kind of how we view the ESB in our use cases. We only use it when it's absolutely necessary. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, so finally, uh, so both of uh, you guys and the organizations have successfully developed the API platform. I would like to know wh what are the evangelism you have done to make it a successful adoption within the organizations? Well, I think what's made it successful was our CIO ordering everyone to, to use <laughs> it. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't think anyone would have ever adopted. But you know what happened, though, originally was that wasn't really enough because people find ways to check the boxes and, they, and say they've done it. So then we, we added <clears throat> stricter and stricter governance around things, some of which I showed you, and then even that eventually, um, people figure out how to game that too if they're not really interested. <coughs> Excuse me, so the bottom line is people have to actually see the value in themselves. That's why we tried to make the experience as lightweight as possible so people can try it and actually get value out of it. Also just giving extra insights into their, uh, what their usage with analytics, things they didn't have before. So we try to, uh, there has to really be a more than just you've been ordered to do it reason. There, there has to be some value add. So we try to add as much value as we can, show that to people. And at this point, the, there's definitely been a turning of the corner. And at this point, everyone is anxious to get their APIs in the store. Also, I mean, that's really the only way we're officially now trying to promote them to the outside world. And again, all the in, internal applications we build have to be built upon that. So it's a combination of I don't know if it's carrot and stick, but it's a combination of brute force and actually trying to make it an appealing thing to do. I love that you brought up the carrot and stick because we actually just used that in a meeting last week. Um, we kind of talk about how we have the carrot and the stick and we have a separate stick. Um, and so we kind of, in some cases, we are arm twisting a little bit. You know, We're shutting down an old platform. They have to migrate. They have to op adopt our new system. Um, and also kind of in a little bit of that twisting an arm, we've, we've tried to encourage developers to make sure that their APIs can only be consumed through our API gateway. Um, things like validating that the JWA only comes through the specified gateways from where we know. Um, and so we're really locking down so that everyone has to go through that. Um, but also, at the same time, we're trying to pull out a carrot and a stick and not seem so evil. And um, offering actually a lot of incentives to our on-campus people. Um, we're actually in a meeting with our CIO last week. He discussed the idea of we're going to set up a, a test API to kind of onboard them that orders them t-shirts and sends them to their office um, you know, to try to get them to onboard and have some kind of fun little gimmicky thing to promote them actually moving so that it doesn't just seem like, oh, we have to move because they're going to shut us off, but try to make it fun as they go. Add one more thing. Yeah. You just reminded me. Another thing that we did that you just totally uh, 
made me think of this is we've put on a number of hackathons. And that's a way to kind of gamify, they'll make it fun for people also. And there are actual, there were actual prizes. Uh, I didn't get one, but I know people got them. <laughs> but we've run actually quite a few of them. First, we did a whole bunch of internal ones just to try to figure out how to do it. And then we've recently run a few external ones with where real customers have come. And one thing we did, by the way, to facilitate that was we built a, we've built this service that can generate um, uh, simulated responses by looking at the swagger. You can also pre-populate that service with sample data and things like that. So there's people can sign up and subscribe to an API, and, and then we, we point the sandbox environment to that. So if they use the sandbox keys, traffic is directed to the sandbox server, and that sandbox server can generate real responses. And more than that, it can actually accumulate side effects when you post. The data actually gets accumulated and will be returned later. So we did things like that so that we could make the hackathon successful. We wanted the hackathons to be successful so we could kind of create some excitement and some internal marketing. So that was the other main thing we did. You, you actually reminded me. We actually have done a lot of that similar kind of stuff and tried to, especially with our on-campus um, partners, we've got some that are huge and critical to the university actually running. And so we've tried to offer all of our services. You know, we've got developer times from internally sent to, you know, send developers out there, handle that, you know, if they need that kind of help. Um, we do something every Friday in OIT called Crazy Friday. Um, where we get together for the whole day and it's just kind of an unconference. Whoever wants to talk about whatever or work on whatever, we all kind of work on it together. Um, and so we try to do a lot of that migration work and help those developers, especially internally, to figure that out as we're doing that. Um, and we also we utilize standards and so there's libraries available, but there's kind of a combination of standards, as everyone knows, to, to get all the pieces put together. Right. Um, for example, to validate the JSON web token, we use OpenID connect config the dot well known address to publish that public IP address. And so to help the developers piece all of those standards together, we've, we're in process of producing quite a few SDKs in several languages that we use to make it so that validation of the JWA is a one-click kind of a thing, and so that they can quickly move their producing APIs over as well as their consumers and make that just as easy as possible and help them follow the best practices. Okay, awesome. Um, so yeah, so with that, I would like to open the floor for any questions. Uh, so we, we discussed a lot of topics during the day. Uh, would like to have you take questions and move forward as a discussion. Okay, so can I just clarify the question real quick? You want to know if on top of the development teams who are developing the APIs, that we have a team that kind of helps all of the infrastructure as well? Okay, so yeah, absolutely, that is my job. Um, I don't, I don't, I do produce APIs. I also have, you know, other jobs, but we wear multiple hats at BYU. Um, but I, I have a team, you know, there's several people with me that support the actual infrastructure. That is something we do on a day-to-day -day basis. We work on upgrades, patches, when there's issues we're resolving and we deal with monitoring, all of that. Um, and trying to make everyone else's lives easier so that they don't have to worry about any of that. You know, we're kind of saying our team is going to handle it. We promise you our infrastructure will be up. You know, we promise that if you have a problem, we're here to help um, and kind of go from it from there so that none of our developers are having to worry about that. We don't want them to do infrastructure and code. We want them to just code. We did some technical things and some social things. Um, I mean, first of all, all, these, all the different service groups we have and the different lines of businesses they already, originally they already had their own ways of doing support. So once you put everyone into one store, how do you handle support? So this is not something I was directly involved in, but we did send up, set up a central triage kind of support line that anyone could go to as a starting point. Uh, but to make, it, to make it worthwhile, we built in a lot of, um, we built tools for metrics so that you could see how the health of an API. We built in some governance tools and some specialized APIs that would let, you could query an API and find out who the service owner is and things like that so that people had a, a chance of finding out who to, who to get a hold of next. And that's a dynamic thing that's always being updated. It lives with the API. So we did a little bit of both. I, I'd say we're still probably really working that out because it's quite a huge social transition to go from totally separate silos of support into one centralized. Uh, but, that, but that's the direction we've gone in. I wanted to bring up also that we do partner with WSO2 and we utilize their production support as well, which has been super helpful in some of those cases where we've had issues. 
other questions? So uh, this is for Randy. I guess I was just wondering uh, what, uh, how did you do the conversion? Is that all client-side JavaScript, the one that goes from SOAP to REST in your portal? Um, it's a combination of, there is a back-end service we wrote that reads the whistle. And it, it doesn't present the RESTful model exactly, but it breaks, what it does is it, it traces through all of the, the XSD, uh, all the definitions and it builds a fully annotated tree of, er of a completely annotated model. Then it passes that back to the Angular JS app, and it, okay. that's where a lot of the analysis is done for what you were seeing. So it's a combination of a, a back-end service that was written in Java and then front-end analysis. So uh, next question, I guess, is for both of you guys, which is you know, the really neat portals, uh, I don't suppose you would consider open sourcing them. Well, I, I'm probably not the one to answer officially, but I know uh, that's something we're definitely interested in doing, and there's an initiative to do that. Uh, I don't know the status of it at this point, but it's our um, the, the upper level executive, um, especially in the technology area of our company, they definitely believe that this is a good thing to do. And so I think it's, it's just such a big change. Uh, it's almost the exact opposite of the normal bank MO to suddenly, instead of normally you hide everything as much as possible, and now it's like we're giving it away. But they do believe it's a good idea. It's good to have as many eyes on it as possible. It's good for everybody. People will find bugs we didn't see, and they'll also be able to convince themselves that we don't have bugs, because they can look at the code themselves. So that's the direction we're going, and we haven't actually gotten there yet, but there is an initiative underway to do that. Cool. Um, for on BYU side, absolutely. Um, we, we develop with the model of open first. Um, we actually very much try to encourage developers to never have a private repository um, so that they're always developing in the open. It just makes it so much easier to go open source later on if you're not dealing with all the cruft left behind of not worrying about it being public. Um, currently, we actually built our developer portal on Drupal. Um, we have a team internally that deals with a lot of Drupal sites, so they were very helpful in all of this. There's a lot of pieces that are of the supporting architecture that are already open source, and I'm just realizing that I don't have them in that meta repo that I linked you to. I will get them there. Um, and then some of the little pieces in Drupal aren't out in their own repositories yet, but we're working on that. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Who wants it? So this is for uh, maybe the, the new ones. So we're looking to leverage API Cloud. And so one of the things we want to do in terms of supporting authentication, we, we want to avoid configuring uh, user accounts within API Cloud. So as such, we want to use federated identity and bound into the API Cloud capability from an SSO perspective. So does API Cloud support federation inbound into your platform? Uh, uh, so, uh, not as yet, but we are in the process of bringing up the identity cloud as well. Okay. So uh, when it is up and running uh, in commercial, it's actually in process now. So the API cloud will be integrated with the identity cloud. So the uh, federation and stuff needs to be configured on the identity cloud. So, right, so if you want to federate with your own uh, uh, IDPs and stuff, right. you can do that on the identity cloud. And since you're using the same account on both uh, the API cloud and the identity cloud, your API system will be federated too with your IDPs. So does that capability currently exist, or is it? Uh, yeah, it, the identity cloud is uh, uh, like, uh, yeah, it's in beta. It's in beta, So okay. uh, yeah, once it is in production, you will get that capability, uh, once it's in GA. Okay, got it. End in, in user authentication. Yeah. Okay, so so there are so I'm uh, kind of running the cloud, so I, I have a quick <laughs> quick answer for that. So basically, there are two scenarios. So one is when you want to uh, federate kind of publishers, subscribers, so people kind of using the uh, the web UIs that we saw in the picture here, right? And and the other one is end users, like people who would access the APIs on their mobile apps and stuff, right? So that's a more frequent scenario. So that scenario is already supported. So for that, you can actually hook up your local directory or your database or whatever. You can expose that as a, as a uh, simple web service. And, and that, and then your, uh, when you need to authenticate your end users from the app, you can use password grant 
uh, to get an OAuth token that's specific to that end user. And in that case, the gateway would use um, that LDAP connection or your web service to authenticate and generate OAuth tokens specific to the end user. And then your, your application, your backend, then can then use a JWT token to figure out who is accessing that. So that's live and that doesn't require identity cloud. Identity cloud is, will be uh, used for the scenario when you want your publishers, subscribers to get uh, their whatever Active Directory credential single sign on. So that is in the works. All right, so uh, so I would like to thank Randy and Run uh, on uh, on this uh, great discussion. I would like to thank everybody who's here uh, since morning and participating on this discussion on API management, etc. Um, and uh, yeah, and hope to see you in the next next year's uh, API discussion. Right, thank you.